As many of you may know or not, if this is your first time here, hi. I love Hannibal Lecter. I love the movies. I love the books because I started reading them last year. And above all, I love Hannibal, the TV show that came out in 2013 by Brian Fuller. I have made videos, I have made vlogs of me reading the two first books published by Thomas Harris, The Red Dragon and The Silence of the Lambs. I will make at some point most likely a movie specific video just talking about the movies because there's a few of them. But today we are talking about the TV show that I absolutely adore and that I watched back in the day and fell in love with and that I needed an excuse to rewatch. And the excuse was to make an unhinged recap of the first, second and third season of Hannibal. And today we are doing the first half of the first season, aka the first six episodes of season one, because I have a full-time job and this has already been too long. <laughs> And I don't want this video to be four hours either way, so let's just split it in two parts. So season one will be two parts, and we'll see for season two. Uh, in case you don't know anything about Hannibal Lecter, which, you know, could be if you were, I don't know, in a coma for the past years, because I don't know, this man, this character has been around for many decades now. Like, if you have never heard of Hannibal Lecter, where have you been? So Hannibal Lecter is a character created by Thomas Harris, and his first appearance was in, was in 1981 with the first book published by Thomas Harris, The Red Dragon. So that was the first appearance for Hannibal and basically it kick-started a passion for Hannibal Lecter because the books became a success. Uh, Thomas Harris did three more books after that. There were many movies and, as I said, a TV show. The TV show, as I said, came out in 2013. The first season came out in 2013 and it is vastly inspired by all of the novels published by, by Thomas Harris. The second season came out in 2014 and the third season came out in 2015. There's a total of 39 episodes and it was amazing, a masterpiece. And I absolutely adore Brian Fuller for creating this TV show because it was just perfection. In the first part of this series, we are going to cover the first six episodes of season one, as I've said. And in the second part of season one, I'm gonna cover episode seven to 13 because each season has 13 episodes. For each episode, I have prepared a cardboard, a presentation for you, which covers the main plot points of each episode. As you can see here, we have like a menu because, you know, Hannibal, whether it's the book, the TV show or the movies, there's a lot of food content. And I decided that to introduce each episode, we're going to look at a menu of the day, menu of the episode. And we have a starter, a main and a dessert for most episodes. There's a few exceptions. We'll look into that when we get to that. And then we have the menu, aka the food that we're going to be eating when watching every episode. I don't think it is necessary, but I will still say it. I am massively going to spoil this TV show. So if you have not seen Hannibal, First of all, do yourself a favor and go ahead and watch it because it's just amazing. And second of all, I will put, you know, the chapters in the video. So in case you have not watched it and you want to watch the app and then come back and watch the recap, you can do it easily with the chapters that I'm going to put in this video. But that's enough for the introduction. Before I start, I'm just gonna say thank you to everyone who is already here watching this video. If you haven't subscribed, please do so because it will encourage me to <laughs> continue the series. And if you like the series, please <laughs> comment and just, you know, general engagement because this video has taken me a long time. And while I have enjoyed the process a lot, I would like to know if you enjoy the, the result as well because it's kind of like a chef. I'm kind of like a chef. I just made a full menu for you guys and I wanna know if you like the food. And that's it. So let's begin. Before I actually talk about the episode, I just want to say that, first of all, thank you to all of the YouTubers who have 
done this type of videos before because obviously I am not the first one to do an unhinged recap type of style of videos. I will link in the description box my personal favorites and you know, the YouTubers that I always watch. <laughs> I ended up doing the Hannibal video because I love Hannibal. It's one of my favorite TV shows and no one had done it before that I know. And so I decided to make my own. As I said, Brian Fuller created this TV show. Thank you so much, sir, because you made a masterpiece. Uh, one of the things that I will sadly not be able to translate to you as I do the recaps is the beauty of this TV show. It is filmed with a lot of finesse, the editing is amazing, and the cinematography is just chef's kiss. You can tell that Brian Fuller hired actual chefs to make the food scenes. As you know, I'm a foodie, so any TV show that's like food, I'm gonna like. And I love horror, so Hannibal Lecter being someone who eats humans is kind of like horror material. And the fact that he there's a lot of cooking scenes in the TV show and you need and you, sh you are to believe that he's making human beings makes the whole like, thing pretty gore and creepy, which, as a fan of horror and food, makes the whole experience very enjoyable. I am not condoning the act of, of cannibalism, and even though I'm gonna compliment and be very excited about the shenanigans that the fictional character Hannibal Lecter does, I do not condone, and I repeat, I do not condone cannibalism. It is fictional, and it, is, it should stay that way. It just, you know, make things clear. Now, first episode. The first episode is called Aperitif because every episode of this TV show has a name that's related to food. So Aperitif is our first episode and Aperitif is usually what you have at the beginning of a meal. So thank you, Brian Fuller, for your brain. That's it. I'm, I'm gonna compliment Brian Fuller the entire time. This is a Brian Fuller fangirling video. <laughs> As I said, I have a menu here. Uh, in the menu, we have a starter. In the starter, we have getting to know our characters because what is a pilot episode without getting to know our main characters? As a main, we have the crime of the week, which we will see in many of the episodes because the format of this TV show is that usually we have a crime, kind of like, you know, the old style CSI Criminal Minds episodes where you have a crime and by the end of the episode, they solve the crime. That's kind of the style. So our main for aperitif is gonna be crime of the week because it takes basically the main plot of this episode. Doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen often. And as a dessert, we have the crime of the week resolution. And I chose to put the crime of the week as a dessert, even though technically it's already the main, because the crime of the week that happens in the pilot episode is something that will become a recurring plot in the next episodes so it does become a main thing in the end so you know that's why that's why it's featured twice we're gonna get to know our characters that's the entree the starter and the first character that we get introduced to is will graham our baby our psychoanalyzer fbi agent he is very talented he has a very special ability that makes him very valued by the fbi but obviously there's always a but He's a bit mentally unstable because his superpower-ish makes him a bit vulnerable to, <laughs> you know, what he does. And basically what he does is that he is capable, as we can see here, of recreating crime scenes in his brain and puts himself in the position of the killer. This helps him understand things about the killers that other FBI agents or detectives cannot you know, come up with. So he's extremely empathetic. He can really put himself in another person's shoes, but he puts himself in serial killer shoes, which contributes to his instability because obviously sometimes the line between am I just very good at my job and am I actually a serial killer gets a bit blurry sometimes. So, you know, so we have Will over here. He's very beautiful. Hugh Dancy plays him beautifully. Then we have Jack Crawford. I'm using this as a microphone when just a spoon, but we have Jack Crawford over here. He's the main detective, the main boss. He is very selfish because he is aware of Will's weakness, of Will's mental health. 
but he clearly doesn't give a shit. Like this man, he has an objective and his objective is to catch killers. And he doesn't care that Will here is a poor baby. Look at him, him happy here. He's all happy, he adopts dogs. He's like, you know, a happy puppy. But Jack doesn't care. Jack wants Will to go through his process so that like he solves serial killers, which granted, I would do that too if I had someone like Will, but maybe give him a break every now and then. And there comes Alana Bloom, Dr. Alana Bloom. In the books, fun fact, Alana Bloom is Alan Bloom, he's a man, but Brian Fuller said, <laughs> I'm gonna hire more women because Thomas Harris is a man and he wrote a lot of men in his books, not a lot of women. And so we have Dr. Alana Bloom, who is a very close friend of Will. And she is worried about Will because she's like, he's not mentally stable, Jack. You should not make him do these things. But Jack ultimately says, I'm gonna do whatever Will wants to do. And Will says, I'm gonna do it. Because as I said, Will is a very nice person and he wants to help solve crimes. So he's gonna do it. In the first episode, we also see one of the, you know, we see the forensic team. Uh, we actually don't learn the names of the forensic team until very late on in the season, which is very weird. Like, I don't know, they're there from like the first episode and they're like the recurring forensic team that we're going to see in all of the episodes until like season three. So I'm like, why? But special mention to Cats because I don't know why she's a badass and I like her face and she's the only memorable, I guess, forensic team member because the other one are just white men. And to be honest, like I didn't put them here because... There's already enough white men in this TV show, <laughs> we don't need more. And they're just like there to do forensic stuff. So those are, I guess, the first four characters we are introduced to. And then obviously we have the one and only Hannibal Lecter over here, like our little baby. And I mean, does he really need an introduction? So with our characters, I just did you the introduction in the TV show, the introduction is done naturally like as the episode goes by and as the crime of the week is introduced but because this is the first recap i did a bit i did a bit of the job for you now as i said the main thing in this episode the main dish of the episode is the crime of the week and the crime of the week is the minnesota shrike will over here is introduced as a teaching uh professor in the FBI Academy because he's still very talented but because of his instability instability he is you know his tasks his duties are to teach at the FBI and we see Jack enter and be like we need you it's kind of like the Avengers like he goes to Will like we need you to help us here because we're like another girl has been missing and <laughs> we don't know what to do so Will goes with Jack to investigate the Minnesota Shrike, and they go to the house of the latest victim. When they go there, Will is like, can I sit in the room of the victim? Because, you know, I get inspiration. I get in the mind of the killer when I see things that are related to the victim. A uh, little disclaimer, I will not show crime scene photos or screen caps of the crimes of the week because most of them are pretty gore and I feel like if you've watched the show, you don't need a reminder. And if you're just watching this for the vibes, you're gonna go with my description and that's it. Uh, so Will goes to the room of the victim. And as he enters the room, he is surprised by the body of the victim. He's like, wait, but didn't the Minnesota Shrike leave no body behind? Like the dude, like he would kidnap these women, but there would be no traces of the bodies. Like, these women would just disappear. What connects them is that they look similar and that like, you know, they have certain profile stuff that like makes sense, but the bodies are never found. So Will is like, why did this body get returned? Like, this is very suspicious. So the body gets taken to the FBI, the forensic team investigates. Body of the victim, they found antler velvet. So Will is like, hmm, that's weird. That's usually used for healing wounds so it kind of feels like the killer is trying to undo the killing which is weird because he didn't do that before with the previous victim so what's up with that like you know like hmm, suspicious and the thing is like while they're having this conversation about you know with the forensics team like will is like something is wrong with this victim 
there must be a reason why the Minnesota Shrike didn't do with her what he did with the others. And so one of the forensics team is like, well, she has liver cancer. And Will is like, oh my God, what? It means that something with the liver was disturbing the Minnesota Shrike. And then Will is like, oh my God, dude, I know why we cannot find the bodies. And it's because he's literally eating them. Reveal. And you're like, watching a TV show called Hannibal, your brain is like, well, the Minnesota Shrike must be Hannibal Lecter, but ha! You are a fool if you think that there's only one Hannibal in this universe. <laughs> Brian Fuller, the mastermind he is, the moment Will says he is eating them, like the moment he realizes this, we have a cut scene and we see Hannibal, our baby right here. We see him cook, we see him cook some lungs, we see him make himself a very nice meal and enjoying it while listening to some classical music because he's basically a psychopath and psychopaths, you know, they only listen to classical music. So we get to see our baby right here, Hannibal. And this is his introduction. His introduction is just him cooking some lungs, eating them. And <laughs> this is all happening after Will says the Minister Shrike is eating his victims. So yay, good vibes, basically good vibes. Right when this happens, Will, Alana and Jack also have a conversation about Will's mental health and Will is like, I'm okay, I can do this. Alana is like, no, you cannot. You need to be followed by a therapist, a psychiatrist, whatever. And so Jack goes to Alana and goes like, okay, yeah, propose someone. And as you can tell, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who's a psychiatrist, is going to be Will's psychiatrist and that's how their connection is going to happen. So Will and Hannibal get to know each other, they get to talk and Will is like, you don't get to psychoanalyze me to Hannibal. He's like, babes, you're not going to do that. And Hannibal is like, well, I'm not going to do that if you don't want me to do that. So he's kind of playing it like I'm the cool psychiatrist. That's kind of like the basis of their relationship. Hannibal is always going to respect what Will wants and he's going to be like, dude, if you don't want me to do this, we're not gonna do this. We're just gonna be besties and we're gonna make sure that Jack thinks that you're being followed by a psychiatrist, but I'm not gonna do anything to you. Like, we're just gonna be besties. And since the beginning, you can tell that Hannibal has an obsession with Will. Like, he has some sort of connection with him that maybe even Hannibal doesn't understand. And, you know, this is gonna be a bit of the relationship and the vibes that they're gonna have during the entire first season and later seasons. And, it's the beauty of it is that Hannibal is someone who's extremely, you're going to see later in other episodes, but like he's a very calculated person and he only allows people to see certain faces of himself and things of himself. And with Will, I feel like he kind of sees the possibility of playing a bit more and being a bit more vulnerable with him because Will can put himself in the shoes of a serial killer. So Hannibal is like, oh, maybe he can understand me. So. You know, like we start this dynamic of letting myself be vulnerable, but not too vulnerable because I don't want him to discover my secret, but I would like him to understand my mentality, my psyche. We're going to talk about the relationship of Will and Hannibal in a lot of episodes. So this is just the beginning. We're just dipping our toes. And so Will and Hannibal start talking, start their sessions. And basically Hannibal is going to become a confidant to Will because Will is going to talk about the cases to Hannibal and be like, well, so I think this, I think that, and I think he's a cannibal and whatnot, and yada, yada. And so another body has been found. And this is the body of Cassie Boyle. And Will is a bit surprised because this time the body has been exposed. The body has been set, mounted on an antler set like naked woman on the, you know, antler set, like impaled. And Will is disturbed by this because he's like, the Minnesota Shrike, he eats his victims. He uses every part of the victims. And this is not the Minnesota Shrike. This is a copycat. So we are to believe that the copycat is Hannibal over here and that he's doing this to throw Will a bit like off his tracks from the other cannibal and kind of like playing around with him. But the thing is, Will 
understood from the beginning that this was not the Mr. Shrike and, he, and Hannibal, Hannibal was a bit impressed like mm, dude you saw that it was not him so Hannibal is like mm, yes 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 and Will is like no no this guy he's playing with us but this is not the Minister of Shrike so he continues the investigation and with the investigation they get to a construction site together Hannibal and Will together because they're gonna be boy <laughs> they're basically tied at the hip from the first step to the last one like they're basically gay for each other and there's a lot of fan fiction between the two of them but to be honest they're very gay together like so they go to this construction site and Hannibal here he's like hmm I think Will found the guy <laughs> and as a fellow cannibal you know cannibal to cannibal uh, not good I'm gonna give him a heads up because you know, I'm also a cannibal and I guess it's in the cannibal code that they should defend themselves and like, you know, whatever. So Hannibal calls Garrett Jacob Hobbs, which turns will turn out who will turn out to be the Minister Shrike. And so Hannibal is like, they know. Like he just picks up the phone and they go he was like, they're coming. They know. <laughs> they know it's you. So Garrett Jacob Hobbs is like what so he was in a frenzy mode he was making breakfast with his family and he's just like chilling having a sunday morning and then there's will that arrives and he's like ha i found you motherfucker and so when they arrive will ha, finds the wife of gary jacob hobbs with her throat slashed in the entrance like she's dead she's long gone and they go to the kitchen quickly hannibal and will and they found gary jacob hobbs with his daughter that looks very suspiciously similar to the victims, like she's a copycat of the victims, clearly like a surrogate. And Garrett Jacobs has a knife to the throat of the daughter, and Will's like, oh my god, oh my god. And so Will grabs his gun, thinks fast, and shoots Garrett Jacobs Hobbs. Problem is, as we've seen throughout you know the entire episode, Will is a bit unstable, so Will just doesn't shoot once. Will kind of shoots like 10 times Garrett Jacob Hobbs. In the meantime, uh, the daughter, Abigail Hobbs, has gotten her throat a bit slashed. Not a lot, just a tiny bit. And Hannibal is like, to the rescue, because he's also a doctor. He used to be a doctor for the body. Now he's a doctor for the mind. But he goes to save Abigail. He puts his hands on her neck. She saves her. Très bien. All good. Hannibal saves the day. Will saves the day. But... Alana over here she goes to Jack and she's like did I say or did I not say that he was getting too close now will puppy happy all good cute face cinnamon roll will has murdered Garrett Jacob Hobbs and has left Abigail an orphan and that's gonna bring some problems and Jack is like Alana please calm down I kind of hate Jack because while I understand his motives of finding the killers and whatnot, I also find him a bit too, how to say, like selfish. I think I said it at the beginning that I find him very selfish, but he's very selfish and also sometimes a bit misogynistic. Like he really disrespects Alana and he only listens to what Hannibal wants to say. Maybe because Hannibal says what Jack wants to hear, but I don't know, like I find him a bit off-putting sometimes. And in this conversation where Alana goes and tells Jack like, that you fucked up, Jack is like, nah, I'm all good. But the end of the episode is Abigail Hobbs in the hospital bed. On the right, we have Will. And on the left, we have Hannibal. And this is why the resolution of the crime of the week is the dessert. It's because this will start the, gel the guilt feelings of will of having killed someone of having orphaned a girl and a whole relationship dynamic between will abigail and hannibal that will you know grow and continue in the next episodes and that's basically episode number one in every episode we see food mentioned or featured and in this episode we see food three times we see food when Hannibal is introduced, he's eating the lungs that he cooked. We don't know what exactly, but it looks like some sort of like salad like with oranges and he's eating the lungs. I think it's his least appetizing meal that he eats during the TV show. 
He also brings scrambled eggs and sausages to Will because he's like a sugar daddy and he wants to treat his princess well. And he says that he's very careful what, with what he eats and what he puts in his body. So this is also the beginning of Hannibal feeding human meat to Will without people, with, you know. This is the beginning of Hannibal feeding meat to other people he knows, whether it's friends, colleagues or whatever. He just likes to spread the good food that he cooks whether it's human or not, we are to assume that every meat that Hannibal serves to people is a human being, obviously fictional. And then we see Garrett Jacob Hobbs having breakfast. So, you know, sausage and eggs again and bacon and whatnot to his family, like with his family. So that's for episode one. A lot of things happen in this pilot. It's quite an intense pilot episode, but I feel like it really sets the mood for the remaining season and seasons. Like, we get the relationship between Alana and Jack, the tensions between them. We get the relationship between Will and Hannibal. That's gonna continue and intensify during the next episodes. And we also get a bit of the, you know, future relationship between Abigail and Will and Hannibal. And kind of like the mood and the episode structure for the upcoming episodes. And that's about it for episode one. Episode 2 is happening. Episode 2 is called amuse-bouche, which is a term to describe a tiny appetite, a tiny thing, a tiny canapé that you eat, hello camera, that you eat as a, you know, in a party to kind of like have fun in your mouth. It's really what it means, amuse-bouche, you have fun in your mouth. So that's what we're eating for this episode and the menu is as a starter, we have the leftovers of last week's crime because as I said, we're gonna see a lot of Gary Jacob Hobbs and a lot of Abigail Hobbs in the next episode. So get used to it. The main is crime of the week, even though the crime of the week this time is a bit softer, but more disgusting in terms of like, <laughs> what the fuck? Like really, you'll see, you'll understand. Then we have dessert, which is Hannibal's master plan. I decided to describe it to talk about it that way because that's basically what it is. And so with that, we start the episode with Will just not being okay overall. And this is again a recurrent theme that we're gonna see. Why is my camera not focusing on me? Oh my God, okay. Will is not okay. Will is having nightmares. Will is gonna have a lot of nightmares. It's gonna be very present in a lot of episodes. And it this episode really marks the decay, the decline of Will's mental health because it will get worse and very quickly like eh, it started let's go let's say it didn't start that good but it's just gonna go downhill very quickly so he's starting to have nightmares he's starting to wake up at weird times during the night and he's having hallucinations of Gary Jacob Hobbs aka the man that he killed with his gun in the previous episode and when Will arrives at his workplace, aka the teaching academy, he gets greeted by his class like applause, like round of applause because he caught, well, he killed <laughs> Garrett Jacob Hobbs, the minister of strikes, so everyone's like, oh my god. And so Will is a bit awkward about it because he's like, yeah, I mean, I, okay, I got it, but like, you know, I still orphaned someone and he still killed like eight people, so <laughs> not funny. And so Jack comes to talk to him and he's like, you know, I recognize that maybe this has been traumatizing for you, so maybe you should talk to Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. And so Will is gonna go talk to Hannibal and they're gonna have a conversation and this camera pointing, like not focusing on me is pissing me off. Jack has said that Will cannot go back to the field if Will doesn't get cleared by Hannibal. And when we see Hannibal and Will's first session together, Hannibal is like, dude, I don't care. I'm going to sign this paper. You're going to go back to the field and then we can actually have a, you know, an actual conversation about what you feel without like formalities and paperwork and whatnot. And he's like, oh my God, he's such a cool psychiatrist. Like he's really not, you know, one to be intimidated by Jack. So as I said, this kind of is going to set the mood of Will and Hannibal and always having this relationship of like Hannibal playing it, the cool psychiatrist and Will being like, Oh my god so you know that's important and so the next thing we see is the crime of the week and prepare yourselves because this is very disgusting someone has found a burial ground 
with five or six bodies. And they have been infused and buried in the ground and they have been used as fertilizer to have mushrooms on them. The mushrooms that you see here are being grown out of human beings. As I said, it's very disgusting. And turns out they're not dead, actually. They were just being kept alive so that you can make like some sort of juices and get it, extract them. Uh, but they all die, like don't, like don't worry, no one has survived to know that they were used as a mushroom fertilizer. So, you know, in the midst of all of it, we get introduced to another new character, which is over here, over here, over here. She has amazing curls, she has amazing hair. Her name is Freddie Lounds, a journalist. And again, in the books, Freddie Lounds is a man, but Brian Fuller said, say no more men. I'm gonna put women and they're gonna be hot. And Freddie Lounds here is being sneaky, taking pictures of the crime scene and talking to the cops and, you know, getting information. And she's gonna publish articles about it on the internet. And she publishes an article on Will Graham, calling him, an unstable analyst, FBI agent, you know, everything bad that you can think of, she's calling Will that. And so that's gonna kind of let us know that Freddy is a ruthless journalist that just works for like BuzzFeed Crime of the Week, like really, like she's not working for a good newspaper, like she's working for an online thing. And it kind of sets a bit the relationship that Freddy's gonna have with everyone else in the TV show. So with that being said, Will goes back to talk to Hannibal and finally confesses that he's been hallucinating our one and only Garrett Jacob Hobbs. And Hannibal is like, it's fine, really. I can get it. You're a bit traumatized by what you did to Honey, like to Abigail. And I can understand that you have some sort of guilt on your conscience because you basically made the, the girl an orphan. Like she has no parents. And now you feel like you need to replace that void that you created by killing her own dad. And this is what I call Hannibal Master Plan. In this episode, you can really see how Hannibal's brain is working towards debilitating Will Graham's mental health even more, but doing it very subtly so that you don't really suspect and that so Will doesn't suspect. And his goal is to really have pure control of Will. And I said this in the last episode recap is that Hannibal, you don't really know, does he want to destroy Will or does he, he want Will to understand what he does and therefore have an ally? So that's the main thing. But Hannibal is going to start his master plan. That's a reminder, the dessert of this episode. He's going to start pulling the strings behind Will and making him believe things that are tr not really there necessarily. So... Hannibal and Will start this conversation. Hannibal is kind of making him understand that he should feel guilty, but not too guilty. Because he's still his psychiatrist. Like, he cannot do it super, like, directly. And our one and only Freddie Lounds. Turns out she was at the session and she was recording what Hannibal and Will were talking about. But Hannibal is smarter than anyone else. Like, come on, it's Hannibal Lecter. You don't go and be a cannibal for decades without anyone finding out if you're not good. So Hannibal is like, mm, bitch. And so he makes her delete the thing. And this is the first time that you kind of see like a bit of the bad vibes that Hannibal can give if you cross him. Like he really is imposing on Freddy. Like he goes like, Miss Lounds, you're not going to use that. You're going to delete it and you're going to delete it now. Please, thank you. Bye. Another thing that happens in this episode is, as I said, Hannibal's master plan. And he starts having dinners, as you can see here, with Jack. He starts having dinners with Jack, serving him food, serving him humans, and talking about Will and the cases and whatnot. And basically, this is again Hannibal's master plan to manipulate everyone around Will so that like he can later choose to do whatever he wants. If he wants Will to be, if he sees that Will is on his side, he's going to use what he did to protect Will. But if he sees that Will is not on his side, he's gonna use what he has been doing to destroy Will. Basically, that's his master plan. The crime of the week advances and, and they discover that the guy, the killer, he's over here, he was using victims that were like diabetic 
and like using his insulin and like you know their insulin and depriving them of insulin so they discover that he's a pharmacist because like you know someone that can deprive people from having insulin is a pharmacist so they find the guy but when they go to arrest him they realize that the guy has escaped because the guy was reading freddy's article like you know that she published and so they go like mm, she fucked up and we can see freddy here all bloodied and whatnot because the killer actually gets pissed and he's like fuck they found me and it's your fault bitch and so he goes and he kills the cop that leaked the information to freddy and freddy's like fuck <laughs> i'm in trouble and so jack gets pissed at freddy she's like he's like you need to tell me where he is you need to tell me everything you know about him blah 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 blah, blah. and so they realize that the guy the killer has actually gone to the hospital because a lot of Freddy had information on Abigail Hobbs. And so the crime of the week of the second episode is connected to the crime of the week of the first episode because the killer of the second episode is going to kill the victim of the killer of the... Like, is going to kill the daughter of the killer of the first episode. Jesus Christ, I'm tired by saying that. So we see our killer with Abigail. But Will, he is there to save the day again. And... This time, he doesn't massacre the body of the guy. He just shoots him in the arm, which shows that he's improving, that like a certain magic by Hannibal has worked on Will, because this time he effectively doesn't kill the killer. Success. So that's episode number two. It has a very similar structure to episode number one. There's a lot of similarities to, you know, what happens? We get introduced more characters, we get another gory crime of the week, we see more of the relationship between Abigail and the rest of the characters because Alana is going to become the therapist of Abigail. We see Hannibal's master plan of manipulating Will and to make him his puppeteer in a way. One important thing that happens at the end of this episode is that before Will, you know, when Will shoots the killer, the killer is a bit shocked because like, I thought you'd understand. You know, I thought the fact that you could put your mind into what I do, you'd understand why I've been killing these people. And I think that really sums up well what Hannibal is trying to do with Will. Like Hannibal's master plan is trying to understand, trying to see if Will will understand him. And as I said, whether or not Will will end up understanding him or not, is going to decide Will's fate. And that's episode number two. In this episode, we see Hannibal cooking some pork loin. Very good, looks delicious. And that's all the food that's featured in this episode two, Amuse Bush. And now we can go to episode number three, which is called Potage, like soup, basically. Episode three is named Potage, and Potage is the only episode of season one that doesn't feature any food at all. There you go, fun fact. On our menu, because we do still have a menu either way, we have, as per usual, our starter, main and dessert. For starter, I put Freddy Lounds, the journalist, in case you forgot about this beauty right here. She's still annoying. She is pretty much a pain in the ass this episode. And everything that happens in this episode is caused by her-ish, in a way. So yeah, she's a starter. Like she needed to be featured in the menu. In the main, we have revisiting our favorite crime of the week, aka Garrett Jacob Hobbs, in case you forgot who Garrett Jacob Hobbs is by the third episode, which honestly, if you have, please go watch it again because I, I don't see how you could forget who Garrett Jacob Hobbs is. But Garrett Jacob Hobbs, the cannibal who kills, who killed a lot of young girls, a lot of young women, whose daughter, who tried to murder his own daughter and failed, and who was killed by Will. And in this episode, episode three, we're gonna see a lot of the, you know, follow-up and a lot of stories that still are impacted by this crime of the week for like, from the first episode, so that's the main dish. And dessert, we have Hannibal's manipulation as for dessert because this is the first episode where we actually start to see Hannibal and how his mind works and how he's gonna make 
how he pulls the strings behind people to make people do what they want. The episode begins with a flashback. We get a flashback of Garrett Jacob Hobbs and his daughter, Abigail Hobbs, you know, the girl that's arrived. She's still in a coma, but like, you know, she's gonna wake up soon, spoiler alert. And we get a flashback where Garrett Jacob Hobbs and Abigail Hobbs are in the woods. They're hunting a deer, they hunt together, they do a lot of shit together. And Garrett Jacob Hobbs is teaching his daughter how to poach and, you know, prep the deer once they killed it and like to use every part of the deer. Obviously, a lot of symbolism in here because Garrett Jacob Hobbs refers to the deer as a she and he says we need to utilize every part of her body otherwise it's a waste and we're killing her for nothing. Clearly this is all a comparison to what he does to the other girls and we see Abigail here touching the deer and you know skinning the deer and doing everything to the deer and we see Abigail having some sort of like PTSD slash nightmare in which instead of a deer, she sees the body of a young girl, like, you know. So we're kind of getting the idea of, did Abigail help, help her dad with just the deers or did, he help, did she help him with other stuff too? Which brings us to Jack's suspicions. Jack doesn't trust Abigail. This is gonna be a recurring theme. The man doesn't trust Abigail. He thinks she 100% knew her dad was a killer he thinks that she 100% helped him catch the girls and trap them and whatnot and he's gonna do whatever it takes to prove this theory. So he asks Will and Alana to kind of like help him prove this theory. Obviously Will doesn't agree. Alana is skeptical because she's like well the girl just came out of a coma so maybe like you know we could let her chill and then prove our theories if needs be. So Alana is gonna be super careful around Abigail. Will is extremely protective of her. Hannibal is gonna be kind of like Will. And Jack just wants Abigail to be proven guilty because he doesn't trust the girl. So that's where we are, which, you know, that's the beginning of the episode. There's two major things that happen, three major things that happen in this episode. The first one is in relation to the copycat killer, in case you don't remember. In the first episode, we see a copycat killer of Garrett Jacob Hobbs, and Will immediately knows that this is not Garrett Jacob Hobbs. And he's like, Garrett Jacob Hobbs would not have left the body. He would have utilized every single part of this girl's body. This is a copycat. So this is the first storyline that we see in this episode. And Will is in the FBI Academy, and he's teaching his students, as per usual. That's what you do in a teaching academy. And he's talking about this copycat killer and he's saying that the copycat killer purposely put the body there to kind of like help them in the investigation. So he's a bit fascinated by this copycat killer, but he's also like, he's a killer either way, so we need to catch him. And like, who's this guy? Like, you know. And the moment he talks about the copycat killer, Hannibal, beauty right here, he enters the FBI Academy class. And you kind you can kind of see that Hannibal is like proud of Will for realizing that you know the body of the girl in the first step was really not Garrett Jacob Hobbs and that it's a copycat killer. And like he has this look of like, am I impressed? Am I scared? Am I both? We also get an information very important bit of information by Will during this class. He says that someone called Garrett Jacob Hobbs before they arrived and that that someone is the copycat killer. So he says this, we leave the storyline here and we continue with this episode. The other storyline that we get in this episode is Freddie Lounge being a piece of shit, annoying and in the middle of an investigation because Freddie, here, our baby, here, beauty, beauty, she goes to talk to Abigail and she's like, do you really wanna trust an FBI guy who is a bit crazy and who killed your dad and do you really want to trust these guys? Like, do you really trust the FBI? Like, you should trust me, Freddie Lounge, a super ethical journalist, and I will publish a book to talk about your experience and everyone will know your story and yada yada. So basically, Freddie is trying to convince Abigail to write a book so she can make money. That's it, like, that's the thing. But we get the first confrontation between Will, Hannibal, and Freddy. And Will is a bit like, how to say, 
crazy around Freddy, like he goes to her and Freddy is kind of pushing his buttons, doing it on purpose, obviously because she's smart. And Will is going to say the famous quote, you should not piss off a guy that thinks as a serial killer for a living. And <laughs> obviously, Freddy publishes an article quoting Will on this and obviously they, you know, Jack gets pissed, Hannibal gets pissed, everyone is annoyed. Will is like, I don't care. I hate this woman, she's a piece of shit and like I said what I said and that's it. That's how the Freddy Lounge fucking things up storyline begins in this episode because after doing this, our little Freddy goes to talk to the victim, to the victim's brother in a cafe the ninth victim, so the copycat killer, actually not even a Garrett Jacob Hobbs victim, she talks to the guy and she goes like, hmm, you know Abigail is out and maybe Abigail was helping her dad and she's gonna go to her house most likely, so you should go talk to her because like, you know, maybe she knows something, which is like, woman, why are you stirring the pot? Why are you pissing around? Why are you talking to the family members? Why are you doing this? Like, please stop. But obviously she's not gonna stop. She's not gonna, she's horrendous. She's horrendous the entirety of this, this series. And so the, the brother of Cassie Boyle, the ninth victim, is a bit angry, rightfully so, because you know, if you think the daughter of the guy who killed your sister is out and about and you think she's, you know, guilty, you might be annoyed that she's going home. So, you know, and that leads us to the third thing that happens in this episode, the third major thing. And that thing is Abigail getting out of the hospital, yay, and going to her house, which we see here. She goes to her house and her house has been spray painted and everyone, everywhere it's written cannibals. Cannibals, because I guess this is a thing that happens in a lot of TV shows and movies. Like when there's like a crime or serial killer, cannibal or whatever like people go and spray paint the house and i'm like do people really do this in real life like if i were to learn that a neighbor of mine is a serial killer would i go to his door and write serial killer on it i don't know it's just weird but i guess for the we're doing it for the drama so they get to the house it says cannibals everywhere abigail is clearly like traumatized because she's like oh my god my dad made us eat the food you know made us eat the victims and like she's having these realizations so during the entire episode you don't really know whether abigail is guilty or not or she's just like a victim as well which is kind of the purpose of the episode like jack versus everyone else thinking that Abigail is innocent, Jack thinking she's not, Abigail, you don't really trust her, she's not a very likable character, which obviously helps the whole like, <laughs> did she or did she not help her dad, but you know, they get to the house, Abigail is clearly traumatized, but you know, she's like there, and then a friend of Abigail comes, and they go for a walk, they go for a walk, they're chill, they're like in the backyard, and obviously creeping in the woods, because <laughs> clearly that's the way to go, we see the brother, the brother of Cassie Boyle, you know, the ninth victim, the brother that Freddy talked to, the brother that now thinks Abigail is a killer, yay. You know, the guy that clearly is going to want to hurt this person. Well, he's in the woods creeping like a creep and he kind of goes aggressive at Abigail. He goes like, oh, what's my sister? You killed her, blah, blah, blah. Like very aggressive. And the friend, good friend, by the way, like she's, she's an MVP. She grabs a rug and like just <laughs> like goes at the brother. He hurts the brother. She hurts the brother with the rug. Will and Ab and Hannibal arrive. They make him go away. And Hannibal does a very shady thing. He crosses the little pond that like is you know in the backyard and he hides the rock that hit the brother, which has some blood from the brother in it. He hides it under a leaf like very suspiciously, like he really goes like, oh, you didn't see anything, there was no rock here, no blood. You're like, why did he do this? So, you know, and so all of this, and you might be wondering, why are we seeing a friend of Abigail? Why are we getting introduced to this random person? Well, we're getting introduced to this, we're getting this random person introduced to us because she's gonna get murdered by Hannibal. So Hannibal, Will, Jack, Abigail, the troop, goes to the cabin in which Gary Jacob Hobbs 
used to skin the deers and the girls. And as they arrive there, there's like blood falling on the face of Abigail and she's like, oh, what the fuck? So they go upstairs because the cabin apparently has two floors and they find the body of the friend of Abigail, rest in peace, who has been like put there like a deer on the antlers. Anyway, like a, a full, a full image, like really like Hannibal really does have a flair for the dramatic. Like he really has imagination for these crimes and posing the scenes. And so Will right away, he's like, this is a copycat killer. This is the copycat killer. He's met, like, he's methodic. He's not gonna leave any trace. We're gonna find no DNA, nothing, nothing, nothing. Wow, Will, you're gonna be wrong. We continue with our episode and Abigail goes back to the house. Abigail is clearly traumatized. Abigail is there with Hannibal and Alana Bloom. Very important information. Will is nowhere to be seen. I don't know where Will is at this moment, but like, he's not there. And so Abigail sits down, you know, like in the couch and she grabs a pillow, kind of like an emotional support pillow and she realizes that the pillow is very soft. She's like, huh. And then she remembers what her dad said, you know, you use, you need to use every part of the deer, otherwise you're killing her for nothing. So she opens the pillow and finds human hair from the victims. I mean, I guess if, I don't know, like the guy was resourceful, uh, DIYing pillows right, right and left. But anyway, Abigail, uh, Abigail is horrified. And while she's having like this moment of like, fuck, my dad is a psycho. What's a psycho? Because he's dead. The brother, this guy, who clearly is very unstable, breaks in the house and he goes to talk to Abigail. He goes like, you need to tell me like, did you really hurt my sister? I need to know, you know, like he's very dramatic about it. And Abigail, who's clearly in the middle of something, you know, due to the pillow, the realization that her dad is a serial killer, that her dad is a cannibal, that, you know, all of these things, Abigail panics. And Abigail grabs a knife because she had a knife with her and she butchers the brother. like. When I say she butchers him, like they have a confrontation and the girl, she's like, uh-uh, I might be petite and you might be a boy, a man, but I have a knife and I'm gonna butcher you. And like, she stabs him like 20 times. Like she goes like, clack, 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 clack. And so she panics and she goes like, oh my God, blood on her hands. She tries to go to Hannibal and be like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I fuck it up. Like what to do, what to do. Hannibal, who's I remind you, a mastermind, a criminal mastermind. He sees Abigail with the hands, like the bloody hands, and he grabs Alana, because I remind you that Alana is with them. He grabs her and he smacks Alana against the wall. Alana is knocked out. She's like, what? And Alana is on the floor. Abby, Hannibal grabs Abigail and she's like, show me what you did. And this is the moment where you know his business. <laughs> like. You know he was waiting for this moment to manipulate Abigail into oblivion. So Abigail takes him to the body. Hannibal is like, hmm, you fucked up. So Hannibal, Hannibal takes care of everything. He's like, do you trust me, Abigail? And Abigail is, well, I mean, just kill a man. Like, you know, maybe you should go to the police. And Hannibal is like, do you realize that if you go to the police now, Jack, you know, the guy that doesn't trust Abigail is gonna be like, you're in jail, you're gonna go to jail. And we're gonna forget about this. You literally stabbed the guy 20 times, Abigail. This is not self-defense. This is murder, <laughs> like capital M, murder. And so Abigail, who's still like, you know, processing the fact that she was having a mental breakdown, she was being attacked in her own house and she just murdered someone. She's like, okay, I trust you, Hannibal. So Hannibal's like, I'm gonna take care of this. So he takes care of everything. The body goes away. Everyone is happy, yada, yada, yada. Alana is like, oh my God, I cannot believe this happened. Hannibal hurts himself as well to make everyone believe that he was also like knocked out by the brother of the ninth victim, you know, the, vic the actual victim here. And like, insane. Because you realize that like, he really is a resourceful motherfucker and that he's doing all of this and like, He's doing all of this naturally, like he's not even struggling with it. And so at the end of the episode, we learned two bits of information. We learned that there is the, there was DNA found in the body of the friend of Abigail, you know, in the cabin and that the DNA belongs to Nicholas Boyle, the brother of Cassie Boyle, the guy that Freddie Lounge pissed, 
the guy that attacked the friend, yeah, the, the guy that was butchered by <laughs> Abigail, and you clearly understand at this moment that the reason why Hannibal hid the rock was to kill the friend, plant DNA evidence, and blame it all, blame it all on Nicholas, which is like criminal mastermind 101. And the second thing that we learn is that Abigail escapes the psychiatric hospital at night, like she goes somewhere, we don't know where, and this time she has escaped to go to Hannibal's office, which at first when I watched this episode, I was like, how the fuck does she know where the office is? But whatever, like this is a TV show. And so she goes and Hannibal and Abigail have a little conversation because Abigail has now remembered, you know, at the first, in the first episode, Hannibal calls Gary Jacob Hobbs to tell him like they're coming, they know, but the first person that answers the phone is Abigail. So Ab Abigail has heard Hannibal's voice, but she cannot remember, she cannot know who this man was, she doesn't recognize the voice. But at the end of episode three, Abigail, puzzle pieces click in her mind and she realizes that the voice, the man that warned her dad was Hannibal. So she goes to confront Hannibal and she's like, you're a monster, you're like my dad. And Hannibal is like, I'm not a monster because I'm helping you and I'm not, I'm nothing like your dad. Like he really makes it clear. He's like, bitch, I'm nothing like your dad. I'm not a monster. I would never get caught basically. Like he's like, I'm too good for that. And so we finish the episode with the confirmation, official confirmation that Hannibal is a cannibal too, serial killer, that he's very intelligent, that he's very manipulative and that he is the copycat killer that Will is looking for and that Will 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 continue to look for and try to catch for the remaining of the season so that's how episode three ends and i do understand now why there's no food in this episode because it is an action-packed episode like a lot of things happen in this episode and oof, it's intense it's intense all right episode four is called oeuf and in this episode we get food and obviously we get eggs feature because otherwise it will be a crim like a criminal thing to say of and not have eggs featured in this episode anyway this is to me my personal opinion the weakest episode of the season and you can tell that they needed to advance the story and introduce new storylines but eh, it's a bit like the weakest on the menu off if i don't even know how to talk starter we have hannibal and abigail the relationship that begins after you know the events of last episode abigail, uh, abigail. <laughs> i'm gonna call them like that hannibal kind of feels like her father will kind of feels like her father basically everyone feels like her, fa her father like everyone wants to father this girl which is a bit weird but like they have a lot of issues both of them will and hannibal and clearly they're projecting them onto like this girl anyway so that's the starter the main is the crime of the week as per usual and the theme is family this time we're gonna get there and the dessert is couples trouble aka jack and his wife we get introduced to a new character in this episode we get introduced to jack's wife bella who is like another beauty in town like really brian fuller was like i'm gonna hire only very beautiful actresses for this role and like damn he did anyway the men are also very beautiful <laughs> he was like i just want to be surrounded by beauties anyway so dessert is the drama between jack and his wife and it will follow up in the next episode so it gets introduced in this one so let's begin will hannibal will hannibal hannibal and will in hannibal's office will is like traumatized he's like it's getting harder for me to separate, you know, me, my mind going into the mind of these killers and who I am and whatnot. And I feel like I murdered these victims. I feel like I murdered Cassie Boyle. I feel like I murdered Marisa, the friend of Abigail. I feel guilty. And so Hannibal, very smart bitch, he starts to plant a seed he, he already started it, technically he starts to water the seed of doubt in will's mind and he starts telling him like oh you're doubting who you are you think you're becoming a monster and will at first in this episode he still is a bit fresh so he's like no 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 you're not gonna 
mastermind me. You're gonna, not gonna psychoanalyze me. You're gonna, you're not gonna fuck my mind. I know who I am. I'm not a killer. I'm a good person, and that's it. Yes, I have this weird skill and whatnot, but I am not a killer. I am not Gary Jacob Hobbs. So Will, he's very like, he's still strong in this episode. <laughs> you can feel that like he's like, uh, uh, you're not gonna trick me. But as I said. This is a seed that Hannibal planted on the first episode. He's gonna water it until it grows into a plant, into a full tree, and we'll see what happens, because like, things are going down. Crime of the week. Crime of the week is family murders. An entire family has been murdered during Christmas Eve, I think, or Thanksgiving or some sort of celebration. The entire family has been murdered. They found, you know, everyone. And, you know, I don't think I put any images because they're very gruesome and I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Family has been murdered, they start investigating and they realize that something is off in this crime scene because it looks like the table was set for more people than there were dead bodies. And we was like, wait, they had a missing kid. Like this family, like one of their kids went missing last year and now they're all dead and it looks like this kid was home, so what happened? Also, the mom was killed last, which shows some remorse and whatnot. So they start trying to, you know, investigate and realize what's going on and who's killing these kids. They will find some evidence. To be honest, this case is really weird because I know we are supposed to believe that Will is able to jump conclusions and reach certain you know, and find certain clues that other people cannot because his brain and whatnot. I feel like this one, I don't know, like, they just find another family where the little boy was also kidnapped. They go there, sadly, the family is already dead. So they're like, okay. So it's definitely someone that kidnapped these boys and who's killing the families, as in like, now me, the person who kidnapped you, I'm your family and you should kill your old family and that's how you will be officially adopted into your new family kind of thing. And like, I watched this episode three times and I still don't know how they reach those conclusions, but I don't care. Um, I, as I said, I don't like this episode. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. So they realize this thing and basically they start connecting the dots and at some point they find another kid who matches like the previous descriptions of, you know, the other kids, the other families, and they get their Jack with his Matrix uh, sunglasses. He arrives with the FBI. Will is again facing the mom who was the original kidnapper and the perpetrator and whatnot. And he has his gun. He will really draws his gun very easily. Like this man doesn't hesitate to take off his gun. So he draws the gun. You can tell that she's, he's hesitating because obviously trauma by, you know, Garrett Jacob Hobbs and Kat shoots the mom and she's like, I'm not here for a bullshit kid like Will. This kid is in danger, I'm gonna save him. So Kat saves the day, Will is like, oh, shooketh. And that's it, they solve the crime. Obviously I'm saying, I'm, this all happens in the episode like back and forth, but like I'm doing it by storyline because otherwise it's like too much. And uh, Will is a bit like, Shooketh because it's like, how do you come back from this? Like, how do you come back from being kidnapped, which your family is gonna be happy that you're back and you're alive and whatnot, but how do you come back from the fact that you try to kill every single member of your family? Like, you have no family anymore. <laughs> like, you try to kill them, you know? So it's a bit complicated. And clearly this episode tried to have a crime of the week that was very family oriented so that like, Everything in the episode that feels very family oriented kind of connects. So we have crime of the week with the family gets resolved. Everyone is happy. Well, not everyone. Two families do get killed, but like, you see what I mean? It's also like the softest <laughs> crime. Like, it feels weird to say that because everyone, like, I think in terms of numbers, it's the one that has the most victims, but it's the most standard slash criminal minds type of victims. <laughs> and type of crime like the rest are very much more creepy and imaginative and cannibal compatible but anyway so we get this and on the side we get the storyline as i said at the beginning the starter which is where are they hannibal we get the storyline of hannibal being a dad to abigail because of what happened in the previous episode you know like <laughs> Abigail butchering a, a, a guy and Hannibal protecting her. So they kind of make 
this the relationship between them kind of gets stronger the bond is stronger and Hannibal clearly wants to help Abigail so Hannibal wants Alana to be like let her out of the hospital every now and then like she's going crazy in the hospital they had a conversation like Alana is like you should sleep and whatnot and Abigail is like but I'm not sleeping like I'm having nightmares and I'm like basically the daughter of a serial killer like everyone here knows me and blah blah so Hannibal really wants Abigail to be out of the hospital and because Alana doesn't agree and he's a man he's like I'm gonna do it either way and so he takes Abigail out of the hospital for a visit and he takes her home and he makes her and this is really the worst idea ever he makes a very unstable kid mushroom tea like he brews her mushroom tea so that she goes on a trip and she's like all woozy which i don't know really what he was trying to do here like maybe have even more power over her or whatnot or maybe trigger something in abigail that would satisfy his father fantasy or something but i don't know it's weird abigail comes home <laughs> because abigail is like what a bitch to hannibal abigail is out of the hospital what is this shit and Abi and hannibal is like i know i know but like hear me out she was a bit stressed she couldn't sleep and i gave her a volume and so she's a bit like out of it and alana is like what the fuck hannibal like this is really why i didn't want abigail to be out of the hospital and Hannibal is like, yeah, yeah, I know, but like, you know, just bear with me on this one. I made food. Let's have, you know, dinner with her and whatnot. And so Hannibal is cooking several times in this episode, by the way. And he's cooking and he's cooking eggs, sausage and like bread. And like, that's literally what Garrett Jacob Hobbs was making on the morning he killed Abigail's mob, mom. And he tried to kill Abigail. So Hannibal is clearly pulling a stunt here. And so they're all having breakfast, but it's dinner time. And Abigail is like out of it because she's like on her mushroom trip, like, you know, somewhere in the seventh like galaxy. And she's like, oh, this is what my dad made for me on the day he almost tried to murder me. And Alana is just riding the wave. And I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, <laughs> why are you so chill about what's going on? But obviously she doesn't know that Abigail has been drugged. She just thinks she has taken a volume, but like still, it's it's so weird. Like Hannibal doing shenanigans yet again, yet again. And so this is the second family storyline. Also at some point, Hannibal goes to Will's house and he feeds meat to his dogs and that's it. I don't know what the purpose of that scene is. So as I said, third storyline relating to family, we have here, Jack and Bella, wife. And there's some, there's some trouble in paradise. You can tell that Bella is like not having it. And because the crime of the week is family and having a kid and whatnot, Jack is a bit like, hmm, do I regret having kids? Do I regret not having a family with my wife? And so he talks to Bella. This scene lasts like two minutes, like you can tell there's tension you can tell they're angry you can tell that they're not having a good time and so jack looks at bella and he's like do you think it's too late and bella is like too late for what like what, what, what are you fucking talking to me about at like 11 p.m and jack goes like to have kids and bella looks at him and says it is for me mic dropped we don't know what she means by that we don't know why she's saying it like that we don't know why they're pissed we don't know what's happening but this is the last scene of this episode and it really <laughs> sets the mood and you're like fuck because the episode was very family oriented you're like okay yeah well it's something to do with she's bitter about something kid related so you know and that episode four the there's two actual I, there's two items of food mentioned there's the meal that Hannibal does with Abigail and Alana. And there's also the meal that he prepares for Jack. Because in this episode, we get introduced to the dinners that Jack and Hannibal are going to have regularly. And this is very funny because I'm going to grab my phone because I want to do, I want to say the right quote. But basically, this is just a scene that lasts 45 seconds. One minute. It's Hannibal making food. You can see him cooking. It's very like nice and then we see jack and hannibal having dinner and jack asks what he's about to eat he's like 
what up, what am I eating? And Lecter says, rabbit. The moment he says rabbit, Jack goes like, ha ha, he should have hopped faster. And Hannibal is like, hilarious, Jack. And he was like, yes, he should have. And the moment he says this, we get a cut, like we get a scene of a guy running in the field and Hannibal following him and you're like, unhinged. And so, yeah, episode four, again, not my fave. Not the best crime of the week. Nothing really happens in the ebb. There's not enough will to my taste. There's definitely not enough Alana. And Freddy is not here to do her shenanigans. So the episode is a bit like flopping. <laughs> episode five is in the house. Episode five is to me the beginning of Will's descent into madness. Like we've seen it in previous episodes, but this one, the specific topic and of the crime of the week and something else that happens in this episode really marks the okay it's happening we're going down and it's happening right now so let's begin it's a very sad thing that happens to will so you know <laughs> anyway the man uh the episode is called cookie the starter is hannibal and will hannibal begins manipulating will into his madness into what everything that's gonna happen to Will, like, you know. The main is, as per tradition, the crime of the week, and it's the angel maker killer. We'll get to that soon. And dessert is part two of the previous episodes, uh, the previous episode, sorry. Uh, Jack and Bella couples trouble, and we will see the resolution of that. I'm gonna talk first about Will, the episode begins with Will not being good. He's unwell. He's sleepwalking. We've seen this in previous episodes, but like he has nightmares. He wakes up in the middle of the night, like in sweats, like completely drenched in sweat. And in this episode, we see Will sleepwalking. Yay. In the middle of the night. Yay. Uh, T-shirt, like, you know, with his pajamas, barefoot in the middle of the road. Thank God he has very cute dogs that follow him in the middle of the night because he's not alone. But he wakes up by the cops, like he's awakened by cops that are like just patrolling in the middle of the night. And they're, they can see that like he's not well. Like they're like, okay, man, you need to get this sorted out. So they bring him home, you know, whatever. Will is clearly like very upset slash troubled by what just happened because it's the first time and he's a bit like not good. So he goes to visit our dear friend and his dear friend, Hannibal Lecter. And Hannibal greets him and says, my kitchen is always open to my friends. Which would be a very nice thing to say if it did not mean that he's feeding his friends humans, but whatever. So he makes the same tea that, well, or a similar tea to Abigail's last week's tea, you know, like the mushroom tea and Will takes it and you know, and the starter, as I said, of this episode is Hannibal manipulating Will. And this begins, this began like, you know, previous episode, in previous episodes. But in this episode, he really goes hard at it. Like, he's like, I have no shame anymore. And so he starts putting a seed in Will's mind. Will's mind, which, as we've seen already, is unstable as it is right now. And he goes like, mm, I think Jack is pushing you too hard. So like this little bitch, he just says this sentence and Will is like, no, I don't think so. But like, it will stay in Will's mind. Even though he initially says to Hannibal, it's not happening, it will stay here and it will show up later in the episode. So, you know, Will, Hannibal, they have their conversation and then Will gets a call by Jack from Jack and they have a new crime. The crime is the angel maker. These are two people with their heads on fire not really happening just the killer hallucinating this but basically the angel maker is a guy who kills criminals they obviously realize this later in this in the episode it's like a realization but basically this guy is kind of like a vigilante and he's killing like people who have been either accused of pedophilia drug dealing killing people while drunk etc etc and at first they go like how does he know this like, what is this his deal? You know, like, why is the angel maker killing these people which are all, who are all criminals? Like, how does he know? So they don't really know, but they continue investigating. 
he kills like I don't think I put a picture because it was quite gore but like he kills this couple here like the two head two fire head couple by placing them next to the bed in a praying position with part of their back like back skin open like ripped like kind of making wings and they're like praying next to the bed and Will puts himself in the bed as the creep he is in the mind of the killer and he realizes then that he's putting these people there to pray for him because something is up with the angel maker but they don't know what exactly he has another victim they find many victims this guy is very like prolific like the dude is wasting no time they find another victim in the same angel position hence the whole like angel maker type like title and will snaps a jack at this moment he loses his shit he goes like maybe if you let me be like alone i wouldn't be like doubting myself and i wouldn't be in this position and you're pushing me like he really snaps at him and this is hannibal's doing this is hannibal making will more unstable than he already is and pushing him all over the edge and against jack and so jack is like you're gonna get your shit together you're not gonna talk to me like this and if you ever talk to me like this you're out like I am your boss and you're gonna respect me. Like, Jack is like, I am not here to deal with your bullshit. Like, this is not my problem, this is a you problem and you deal with it. So they kind of have this confrontation. Will goes to talk to Hannibal in the middle of all of it because Will realizes that the killer, the angel maker, is sick. He realizes that he has some sort of like hallucination, schizophrenia type of thing. He starts making a connection with him because he's like, well, this guy is hallucinating things this guy is not good in the head maybe i'm like the angel maker and i'm becoming an angel maker myself so he goes to talk to hannibal about this because he's technically his therapist so like will is actually doing what you should do if you have this thought go see a therapist but do not go see hannibal lecter because he's not working towards your best interest and so we have during this very nice i'm gonna put myself here because you cannot see them you know, they have this very, like, chit-chat, like, very nice, all good. They talk a lot. It's very nice. And during this scene, we have the iconic moment in which Hannibal approaches Will and smells him. Like, literally goes behind his back and goes like... <sniffs> and Will is like, did you just smell me? Like, what the fuck, dude? Like, <laughs> it's very weird. And Hannibal is like, uh, fuck, like, I went a bit too far. And tries to save it by saying like, oh, you're using like your aftershave smells bad or something like that. <laughs> and it's like, dude, I know you're a ha cannibal. I know you like and would like to eat Will. But maybe chill, like calm down. Maybe do not go around smelling people. Like this is very like criminal, like psychopath behavior. Like what the fuck? But it's a very fun scene and I really liked it. So like it's an iconic scene. Like everyone likes that scene. It's very funny and Will's reaction is hilarious. So, you know, very cool, very cool. While all of this is going on, while the angel maker is happening, while the Hannibal Will relationship and manipulation is going on, there's another plot point. Don't forget our dessert. Our dessert is Bella and Jack. Bella and Jack their trouble in paradise and whatnot. Bella is seeing Hannibal now. Not like sexually, like as a therapist. P people really need to stop going to this man to, for therapy, but whatever. So Bella and, ja and Hannibal are in therapy and Bella confesses to, ja to Hannibal what's going on. She says that she feels guilty because she's hiding something huge from Jack. She's hiding the fact that she has stage four cancer and that she's soon going to die. So what she said in the previous episode about it is too late for me to have kids was not in a biological sense like you know a little too late to jack like to realize this at our age but more like i'm basically dying so <laughs> i'm not gonna have a kid <laughs> like eh, very bad so hannibal now has this information jack knows that bella has been going to hannibal but honey is like uh, kind of i cannot tell you this because she's my client and you know, I would be breaking a lot of laws if I told you, blah, blah, blah. So Jack is clearly, like, onto something. And Jack will find out. Like, Jack isn't, like, come on, he's an FBI investigator. <laughs> he's gonna find out. And so, you know, we have all of this. Hannibal invites also Bella and Jack for dinner because he loves inviting people over and making them eat 
people and fun fact this is one of my favorite meals that he cooks and i wrote it and i wrote it down because it's actually quite complicated because the man doesn't just invite you over for for some lasagna like he actually makes a full ass meal and in this episode he makes foie gras au torchon with vidal sauce and figs and roasted pork shank and i love foie gras i know like it's not a thing in the u.s but like it's a thing in europe it's very yummy and figs and roasted pork just sounds super good so this meal it's like this one here like no, he doesn't actually cook the figs and I don't like raw figs But I would love the figs with the pork but like cooked figs anyway So this is what he serves for to Bella and Jack and like it's just Sounds so good. So yummy. But anyway back to the actual story <laughs> Jack and Bella, you know their thing is going on during the episode at the same time as the angel maker and at some point they obviously find clues that leads them towards a guy that could be the angel maker because you know there's like certain characteristics that narrow down the profile and they manage to find a guy and so they invite the wife over the wife there and the wife ex-wife sorry and they invite the ex-wife and they go like so what's going on with him like what's his dealio and she goes like well i actually divorced him because the guy got diagnosed with cancer and he couldn't cope with it and he didn't want any help and at some point like it just you know he shut down he wasn't sharing anything he kept being mysterious he didn't say anything about it and we just you know stopped seeing each other and basically at this moment jack realizes what's going on with bella because the the, the behavior that the ex-wife is describing about the angel maker fits perfectly the behavior that bella is currently showing towards jack about her cancer diagnosis so this is a very sad moment because Jack actually steps down. Like he goes behind the, his desk and you can see in his face and this is like top tier acting. But like Jack shows a lot of emotions in like 45 seconds while the wife keeps talking in the background and he's like slowly realizing that his wife has cancer and that she's gonna die. And all of this is going on at the same time as like the investigation is, you know, as the ex-wife is talking and the investigation is advancing and like they're about to catch the killer and whatnot. But like, it's, you know, very well done. And so with this realization, they find more clues about the angel maker. They realize that he used to, you know, there was a farm where he grew up that like he could be there. And like, they go there. And I don't think I put the picture because again, very graphic. But they enter the farm, Jack and Will, and they find the body of the angel maker. He put himself in an angel position. So he died, like he killed himself. And Will is like looking at the body and he's like, fuck, I'm going to be like him soon. Like he has this realization that he could end up like the angel maker if he doesn't stop doing what he's doing. And so he confronts Jack and he's like, what should I do, Jack? Like, should I stop helping you? And Jack looks at him, and this is, re you know, um, referring to something I said in the first episode when describing Jack, when introducing Jack. But Jack is very selfish. And instead of being a friend to Will at this moment, Jack goes like, if you stop what you're doing, you know that many killers will go on, like, free, that we will not catch and solve as many crimes as if you were, like, continue to helping us. So it's going to way on your conscience and you're not going to be happy either way so jack is basically like if you help us you're doomed but if you don't help us you're also doomed so continue to help us like might as well save people in the process of losing yourself to your mental you know disease and so will is like damn he's right so will is going to continue to help jack is happy because you know he's conflict with Will is solved and Will is going to continue helping him and the end of the episode is Jack talking to Bella and then you know coming to terms with what's going on and Bella is like I don't need anything from you like good you know you're too good at your job like how did you figure this out but like I need time to figure out this on my own and then I will come to you but like noted you know about it end of story we'll talk about it soon end of episode and that's how cookie ends 
So basically, the situation is as follows. Another crime has been solved. Jack is a bit unstable with what's going on with his wife. Like, he's not fully himself because obviously his wife is about to die. And Will is, as I said, slowly descending into madness. And he's starting to doubt more and more his visions, his, like, talent and what he does. And Hannibal is just in the background, like, cooking food for everyone and being like, I'm manipulating Will, I'm manipulating Jack, I'm manipulating everyone around me. And he's quite proud of himself. He's just vibing. Like, Hannibal is just vibing in the background, killing people and eating them and cooking it for everyone and manipulating everyone. He's just being Hannibal. But, uh, yeah. So that's episode five. And now we reach episode six, which is the last episode for this recap. And at the end of my explanation and recap of episode 6, you will understand why part 1 of this video is ending with episode 6. Alright, we're reaching the last episode of this recap and let me tell you, episode 6 is intense. To me, one of the best episodes of the season 1. Episode 6 is called Entrée, which is starter in French. And in this episode's menu, as per usual, we have our menu here. We don't have we only have two items. We have main and side dish because a lot of things happen in this episode. It's very plot dense. So main and side dish is the same thing. It is the Chesapeake Reaper. We're gonna get to that soon. And dessert is Hannibal's facade being discovered. Finally, like we actually see him in, on the screen doing his shenanigans. This episode introduces many new characters. It introduces a serial killer that's already caught and in jail. It introduces a former FBI trainee of Jack, Miriam Blass, and it introduces Dr. Chilton, who works at the psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane or something like that. I think that's how they say it. And so these three characters are introduced in this episode and they will continue appearing in the next ones. There is a new killer introduced called the Chesapeake Reaper. This is a serial killer that Jack has not been able to catch yet and that he was trying to catch with his former trainee, Miriam Lass. And so we're gonna get flashbacks and we're gonna get present time stuff and we're gonna discover all of this. The episode begins with Gideon, Dr. Gideon, a patient in the psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane who is unconscious like he's unconscious in his cell so the guards go like come on let's pick him up let's go take him to the nurse whatnot and so Gideon gets you know taken away he's gonna get treated by the nurse we see him like here you know like this is him unconscious this is him being treated and while he is being treated he wakes up like we realized that he was actually faking it. And when he wakes up, he murders the nurse that was treating him and he murders her in the same fashion as the Chesapeake Reaper. The Chesapeake Reaper, this is an actual scene, like he used to impale <laughs> victims with many objects, swords, corkscrews, everything he would find. And he would like, you know, torture them while he was killing them and whatnot. And Dr. Gideon kills the nurse in the same fashion as the Chesapeake Reaper. So Jack and Will get contacted by Dr. Chilton, the head of the psychiatric hospital. Here we have them, very beautiful. Dr. Chilton is not a beautiful man and he's an asshole too, so we don't like him. And so he gets, he contacts them and he's like, I caught the Chesapeake Reaper. The Chesapeake Reaper has been in my hospital for the past years because the Chesapeake Reaper is Dr. Gideon. Funny scene, <laughs> when Will arrives at the hospital, he goes like, I don't like going into these places because I feel like once I go in, I will never get out. Which is funny, bit sad, but funny. Like, we love a man that's self-aware, I guess. So Dr. Chilton, Will and Jack have a conversation about Dr. Gideon, the guy that is supposed to be the Chesapeake Reaper, who just killed the nurse. And Will is skeptical. Will is like, why would Dr. Gideon show his true colors after being caught so many years later? 
But Dr. Tilton is like very stubborn. He's like, no, no, this is the guy. I know I caught him. I know it's the Chesapeake River. It's him. I know it's him. And so Jack asks Will and Alana to talk to Dr. Gideon and be like, try to find out if it's the guy. So they go there and Will is obviously like, he's not sold on him being the Chesapeake Reaper. This fun fact, this scene between Alana, Dr. Gideon and Will is a nod to the very iconic Silence of the Lambs, Clarice and Hannibal scene where like Clarice enters the hospital. She goes to talk to him. There's the corridor, there's the, you know, the cells and whatnot. So it's very like much a nod to that scene. And so they talk to him and they try to figure out why the fuck would this guy come out now after so many years? And so this is basically the main plot of this episode, finding out if Dr. Gideon truly is the Chesapeake Reaper. And if it's not him, who the fuck is the Chesapeake Reaper? While all of this is happening, <laughs> because this episode, as I said, is intense. Jack here and here and that's it. There's no more Jack. Jack is being taunted by someone. Jack is getting phone calls on his cell phone. And the phone calls are recordings of his former trainee, Miriam Lass. Here, this beauty right here. And we are to believe that Miriam is missing because he's playing the same recording. Every time he gets a phone call, it's the same recording. And it's Miriam saying, Jack, you were right. I fucked it up. Uh, please, I'm in danger, like, you know, so clearly, like, she's not okay. But we will discover that Miriam went missing and they never found the body. Jack is convinced that Miriam was killed by the Chesapeake Reaper while they were investigating the Chesapeake Reaper back in the day. And so, as I said, we have a lot of flashbacks in which we see Jack and Miriam investigating, in which we see Miriam being a bit like Will, like it is hinted that Miriam used to make connections in her brain that would explain things that would help her find clues. And these connections would be very hard to explain. But Miriam was very talented. Miriam was investigating the Chesapeake Reaper and Miriam went missing while investigating the Chesapeake Reaper. So it makes sense that Jack thinks that the Chesapeake Reaper caught her and got rid of her. You know, that maybe she got too close. But he's the only one that believes this, like the forensics team doesn't really believe the same thing. And they kind of think that Jack is losing it a bit because of what's going on with his wife and whatnot. So, you know, there's a lot of things, as I said, a lot of things happen in this episode. So Will decides, official, his official diagnosis is that Dr. Gideon is not the Chesapeake Reaper, but Jack has a good idea. Because Jack is like, hmm, the Chesapeake Reaper hasn't killed in a while. We haven't found any victims. Why would Dr. Gideon now start his thing and like kill a nurse in this fashion? It's a good opportunity to maybe lure out the actual Chesapeake Reaper. So they contact our beauty, our journalist, our favorite journalist, Freddie Lowndes. They ask her, Will, Jack, and Alana ask Freddie Lounds to write an article saying that Dr. Gideon is the Chesapeake River. And they do this to trick the actual Chesapeake River into being annoyed and pissed off and doing something that's gonna, you know, push him or make him, push him towards a mistake. And as the article is out, who is reading the article? Who do we see reading this article? We see Hannibal Lecter, the one and only, reading the article and being very pissed about it, like livid. He's like, who is this guy? Who is this Dr. Gideon? And why the fuck is he claiming to be the Chesapeake River? So we are to believe that Hannibal is the Chesapeake River. So plot twist, plot twist. While all of this is happening, Jack continues getting phone calls, like very creepy phone calls. And, you know, he's a bit haunted by the disappearance of his former trainee. And to be honest, it makes sense. Jack goes to see Hannibal and they have a conversation and Hannibal is clearly showing 
his face as a friend. He's like trying to be nice, trying to be like all, not say peachy because obviously the topic of conversation is quite sad, but being more like empathetic towards Jack. And so Hannibal asks a question and he was like, why would the Chesapeake Reaper show, like, why would the Chesapeake Reaper make you believe or want you to believe that Miriam Blass is alive? Because that's kind of what he's doing. He's kind of getting him the phone calls, like teasing him around and he's at the same time taunting him about it, but also kind of like showing that he, she might be alive. And so Jack answers hope. And so at this moment of the episode, two things happen we get Jack getting another phone call and that phone call leads him towards this place, this place here. It's an observatory, right? Great, awesome. They go there, Will is there, Kat is there, everyone is there. And when they go there, they enter, they find an arm, a cut arm with a phone. Clearly the arm belongs to Miriam Blas, the trainee. And there's also a note, there's also a note, a note that says, what do you see? So we finish this scene and at the same time we finish this scene, we get a flashback of Miriam who made a connection, one of her famous connections and realized that the Chesapeake River had to have medical training because the way he would kill his victims was very surgical the way he would like put the knives and the swords and the corkscrews and whatever he was very precise very surgical very like i know what i'm doing type of style so miriam investigates a bit and she finds that hannibal back in the day used to be a near doctor and so she goes talk to him and she goes there hannibal greets her and miriam is like yeah so i'm here just to talk to you about your time when you were a, a doctor in a ER because one of the victims of the Chesapeake Reaper used to like had an accident and was in your ER and maybe you remember him and whatnot and so they have this conversation and Hannibal he's so good but Hannibal goes like hmm it's true that I used to be an ER doctor but I stopped you know that because it was a bit too intense and I decided to become a psychiatrist and whatnot but I do keep journals of my time you know, <laughs> working there so I could check and see if I have anything on that patient, you know, basically. So he goes away and he goes to the upstairs of his office. And at the same time, Miriam, who's very curious and she cannot stay put, she walks around Hannibal's office and Hannibal has drawings here. You can see a drawing and he draws. He loves to draw because he's he loves classical music. He loves to draw. He's a connoisseur of the arts and Hannibal has been drawing bodies with impaled things in them like swords and forks and arrows and corkscrews and whatever and Miriam is like fuck this is the killer and at the same time Miriam is watching this is discovering this painting we see Hannibal in the back like going down the stairs without his shoes because the motherfucker took off his shoes so he's like with walking with socks and he creeps behind Miriam and this scene is really well done because we have the music and we have everything we have Miriam looking at the painting the drawing and the realization on her face and as she's having this realization we see Hannibal lurking behind her and reaching towards her and then we reach the end of the episode in which Hannibal is grabbing Miriam by the neck and you know like suffocating her and we don't see her body we don't see anything we don't know if she's alive but we do know one thing is that one Hannibal is the Chesapeake Reaper two Hannibal did kidnap slash kill slash we don't know Miriam Lass Miriam Lass almost caught Hannibal, Le Hannibal Lecter so he's not invincible and Hannibal is the one messing with Jack and, you know, the phone calls and whatnot. At the end of the episode, we see this. And this is what I meant by the dessert of this episode. Hannibal's facade is finally seen on screen. This is the first time we actually see Hannibal hurting someone, killing someone. And it is the first time we get the proof 
that Hannibal Lecter is a killer, a cannibal, and someone despicable. And episode 6 ends here, part 1 ends here because it's kind of like the ending of the first half of the first season and it ends with a bang, which is Hannibal finally showing his true colors and us realizing that Hannibal is Hannibal Lecter. And that's about it. So that's episode six. That's the first six episodes of Hannibal Lecter season one. I will be posting part two of this video. I will try to post it by the end of the year or the beginning of 2025, but I will definitely post it before the little pumpkin makes his arrival because otherwise I will be too busy. Season two and season three will probably be projects for 2025 once I have more time and once I settle with my postpartum life and being a mom and whatnot. But all of this to say is I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please, as I said at the beginning of the episode, of the, of the episode, well, it's kind of like a <laughs> TV show, this thing. But as I said at the beginning of the video, please do engage with it, share it with your friends, comment, like it, share it around because it was a lot of work and I loved doing this and I loved making the boards and the analyze, anal the analysis and all of it. But it's always better to see that you guys also enjoyed it and that you appreciate the work. <sighs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> This was very long to film, but I thank you all for your support as per usual. And if you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell button, comment, spread the pumpkin files love, and I'll see you guys next time for more content. Bye.